Alright guys, so at this point it really does seem like Israel is almost trying to make themselves into a global pariah state, because yesterday we talked about the end of their two week raid on Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza, where they essentially just completely destroyed the entire medical complex, torched it to the ground, and then just within like a 24 hour period, we have a major escalatory strike that killed a top Iranian commander that I'm going to talk about in a video later today. And then we also had this strike where they essentially did a triple tap, three different strikes on a convoy of aid workers for the World Central Kitchen. Okay, and we're going to get to all of the evidence here, but this is like as obvious of a deliberate attack as you could possibly imagine. Okay, so we're going to read through this PBS article, just a couple paragraphs to get some basic outlines here. They say, World Central Kitchen halts Gaza operations after Israeli strike kills seven aid workers. I mean, first off, them halting their operations and other aid groups, you know, also joining in in that to some extent, this is part of the goal in these strikes, right? This is nothing new. They've been targeting aid workers throughout the entirety of their offensive in Gaza, but this is part of their goal, right? They are using starvation as a tactic of war. They don't want humanitarian aid to be able to get to the people of Gaza. They want to make Gaza unlivable, uninhabitable for the people there. And so the fact that now the WCK is shutting down their operations, Benjamin Netanyahu is, is smiling at that. But they say an Israeli airstrike killed seven aid workers with the World Central Kitchen, the leading charity, uh, leading the charity to suspend delivery uh, on Tuesday of vital food aid to Gaza, where Israel's offensive has pushed hundreds of thousands of Palestinians to the brink of starvation. Remember Anthony Blinken coming out and saying that now we're at a historic precipice where 100% of the population of Gaza is severely uh, food insecure? And, and this is the first time in history that an entire population has ever been in that classification. Remember that? And then remember how almost immediately after that, the State Department put out a report saying that, no, Israel is not actually blocking the aid from getting into Gaza. I mean, this is what the U.S. government has been supporting. This is what the U.S. government has been complicit in. And the attacks on the aid workers are just one extra part in this intentional starvation campaign. They say footage showed the bodies, several wearing protective gear with the charity's logo at a hospital in the central Gaza town of Deir al Bala. Those killed included three British nationals, an Australian, a Polish national, and an American-Canadian dual citizen and a Palestinian, according to hospital records. So, I mean, they killed an American in this strike, right? What is Joe Biden going to do about that exactly? I mean, remember this quote? back when there were some of those strikes that were happening on U.S. troops in the Middle East, and he said, if you harm an American, we will respond. Are you going to respond to this? When when Israel kills Americans in intentional strikes on aid workers, are you going to, uh, you know, you're going to respond to that in any meaningful capacity? No, of course not. But they say, the World Central Kitchen, a food charity founded by celebrity chef Jose Andres, was key to the recently opened sea route, which offered some hope for northern Gaza, where the UN says much of the population is on the brink of starvation, largely cut off from the rest of the territory by Israeli forces. This is also, you know, the northern portion of Gaza, which is facing this catastrophic situation, is also where Israel just attacked Al Shifa Hospital and completely destroyed it to the point where it is, you can't even, you know, get a close resemblance to what it used to be. And so, I mean, they're just, I don't know how else to interpret this. It's intentional. It is a strategy of their war. They're trying to make Gaza uninhabitable. This is just one extra part on that. And, you know, the reason that I bring that up is because this is not anything unique. And I think it's important to note here, before we get into a little bit more information on this, that, like, the media is covering this a lot more because it's the World Central Kitchen uh, organization that has ties to uh, Jose Andres, this this famous celebrity chef, and also because it was foreign aid workers, right? An Australian, a Polish person, uh, you know, a Canadian American, a British uh, British people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The reason they're focusing more on that is essentially for one easy to explain reason. It's because it has a connection to a famous celebrity, and because the people who were killed were not Palestinians. Okay, it, it's racism, shockingly, right? And so just to put it in perspective in terms of how many attacks there have been on aid workers since October 7th. So, I mean, this is a comparison here. Yearly aid worker deaths in the occupied Palestinian territories and around the world. So globally, if you look at these numbers, when I highlight this here, you'll notice that the highest number that we see, this is all of the global conflicts around the world and how many 
aid workers have been killed on an annualized basis, right? The highest one, it looks like, was back in 2013, where it got all the way up to 158. Now look at the occupied Palestinian territories. It's already at 161 in 2023. In 2023, meaning presumably the bulk of that is from October 7th to the end of 2023, 161 aid workers were killed. So already you have, just in a few short months, more aid workers killed by Israel in Gaza and the occupied territories than in the previous 24 years of global conflicts. I mean, again, it's nothing new. It's just that maybe there's a little bit more attention on this one because of its connection with Jose Andres and because it was foreigners who were killed as a part of these attacks. But here's the response from, from Jose Andres. He says, today... The uh, World Central Kitchen lost several of our sisters and brothers in an IDF airstrike in Gaza. I am heartbroken and grieving for their families and friends and our whole family. These are people, angels I served alongside in Ukraine, Gaza, Turkey, Morocco, Bahamas, and Indonesia. They are not faceless. They are not nameless. The Israeli government needs to stop this indiscriminate killing. It needs to stop restricting humanitarian aid, stop killing civilians and aid workers, and stop using food as a weapon. No more innocent lives lost. Peace starts with our shared humanity. It needs to start now. And he's, you know, obviously correct about that. Um, we also have some more information here as pointed out by Owen Jones. So this was part of the statement that the World Central Kitchen uh, put out just to make it explicitly clear that this was an intentional strike. There's really no two ways about it. So they say, number one, the, the people who were killed were traveling in a deconfliction zone. Okay. Number two, they were traveling in cars that were branded with the World uh, Central Kitchen logo all over it, on the sides, on the top of the vehicle, etc. Number three, they were coordinating their movements with the IDF. And number four, they were just leaving a warehouse. So how do you come to the conclusion that this was not intentional? They were coordinating with the IDF. This isn't even the first time that we've seen, you know, aid workers or medics who are coordinating with the IDF and then are later targeted in drone strikes or other attacks. They've done this repeatedly, over and over and over again. What other conclusion could you possibly come away with? If you're coordinating your movements with the IDF, they see the logo in the cars that you're you're traveling in, it's in a deconflicted zone, and, and you're in the midst of leaving a warehouse. What, what possible justification? Not just a justification for the strike, but a justification to say, whoops, this was an accident. There is none. And it gets even worse. I mean... Mark Owen Jones here was following up on some Haaretz reporting on the, these, these strikes. It actually wasn't just one strike. It was three different strikes. But they say, he says, this Haaretz report, apparently based on a defense source, raises more questions than it answers. Some points. He says, firstly, the source acknowledges that there were three missiles fired from a drone. There's no doubt that the operators knew, knew that it was an aid convoy. This isn't even in question. Number two, upon destroying the first truck, the source claims survivors got out and then entered another truck, and then the second truck was then attacked. The survivors then got out and were attacked a third time. These multiple strikes were done on three different vehicles that the IDF knew belonged to the aid workers. They did a triple tap. They struck the first car, and then some of these survivors of the first strike got into a second car to try to get out. And then they struck the second car, and then it happened a third time after that. Three separate strikes. And it, you can look at a map of where these strikes took place. I think he provides one down here below. And I mean, you can see it, one strike up here, move down the road, another follow-up strike, move down the road, another follow-up strike. And you can even see in the cars, like these missiles were going directly through the roofs, right? There, there's no way you can say that this was not an intentional targeting of these workers. I mean, he continues, he says... Uh, th these multiple strikes were done on three different vehicles the IDF knew belonged to the aid workers. The defense official initially claimed that a single Hamas operative got in the vehicle. They say that he then stayed at the warehouse. At what point did they know his movements? If they knew his movements, why did they wait until he was among the aid workers? Even if the presence of a Hamas member was true, on what basis does that one Hamas member justify attacking three vehicles and killing seven civilians? Furthermore, if the IDF attacked each vehicle in succession, are they implying that the terrorist survived the first and second strike? And how did they know that he survived? And if they did know that he survived, then couldn't they just target him by himself? I mean, listen, guys, we're going through all of this. None of this is relevant, okay? I don't know where the fuck they're getting this claim that there was some Hamas militant that was in the vehicles. It seems like, at least from what I've seen, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. 
But as he points out here, even if there was some Hamas, uh, you know, uh, militant or whatever in one of these cars or had previously been in the area or whatever the case may be, that does not just give you free reign to go and deliberately strike three separate cars that are filled with aid workers on the suspicion that maybe there was a Hamas militant in one of them, which there's not even any real reason to believe that that's the case. I mean, just totally insane, guys. And so now we're left with this. I mean, it's pointed out here by Matthew Gertz, not to be confused with Matthew Gates. Israel bombed an Iranian embassy, killed a bunch of World Central Kitchen workers, and moved to shut down Al Jazeera operations over a single 24-hour period. Seems like Netanyahu was actively trying to isolate the country after the hostage families joined in protests against him. So this is something I didn't get to cover, but yeah, there have been massive protests that have been, you know, sparking off in Israel against Benjamin Netanyahu. Keep in mind, it's been months that, that many of these hostage families of those who remain trapped inside of Gaza, many of the families of those hostages have been calling for months to, to get a ceasefire because they recognize that Netanyahu's, his, his priority and his government's priority, his military's priority, is not to get the hostages out, it's to flatten Gaza. And so they're much more likely, as time continues to go on, to end up killing the hostages than they are to actually get them freed. I mean, there's been, what, literally less than a handful of hostages that have been freed via military, you know, campaigns? That, that has not been happening. The, the massive bulk of the hostages were released that were released from Gaza came during a temporary ceasefire. And so, of course, you know, many of the hostage families, many other people in Israel, you know, are, are putting some degree of pressure on Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, there's a whole bunch of other reasons for this as well. It's not just like, you know, to get the hostages back and whatever, but I mean, obviously things are, uh, I guess, shaky to say the least for Netanyahu, facing pressure from all different sides, from the general public and then also internal pressure amongst his coalition that he's desperately trying to keep together right now. I mean, so many different pressures that are coming down on him. And, and at the same time, you have added pressure now from the, the, the world, from the international community, from people in every corner of the globe, because you just constantly commit war crimes in broad daylight. I mean, we went from the utter destruction of Al-Shifa Hospital to bombing an, an, an Iranian embassy in Syria in a massive escalation that could potentially, you know, spark off a war in, in the region, and then striking a bunch of food aid workers, okay, in clearly marked vehicles on three separate occasions and three separate strikes and then of course trying to shut down al jazeera so that nobody can continue to report on your uh, your war crimes that you're committing and so here's netanyahu's response to this i mean he it's it's laughable guys he says unfortunately a tragic instance of our forces unintentionally harming innocent people in the gaza strip it happens in war we'll investigate it we're in contact with the governments and we will do everything so that it doesn't happen again I mean, what are we talking about here, guys? Again, oh, we're going to do everything so that it doesn't happen again. Is that how we ended up with this situation where where more aid workers have been killed just in a few short months than in the previous 20 years of all global conflicts? That That's how we're supposed to, you know, get an indication that you're desperately trying to prevent this from happening in the future. I mean, unintentionally harming. How is it unintentional? If it's three separate strikes on clearly marked vehicles that were actively coordinating with the IDF. There, there's no justification here. I mean, the same thing here from, uh, you know, Rear Admiral Hagari basically saying the same thing. You know, as a professional military committed to international law, uh, we are committed to examining our operations thoroughly and transparently, right? We also express our sincere sorrow to our allied nations who have been doing and continue to do so much to assist those in need. We have been reviewing the incident at the highest levels to understand the circumstances of what happened and how it happened. So, I mean, again, the only reason that they're even put in a position to to put out a formal response like this from Netanyahu and from Hagari is again because they killed an American. They killed, you know, a British person. They killed an Australian and a Polish person. That's the only reason. If this was an aid convoy that was filled with only Palestinians, they wouldn't be putting out statements like this. But this is unfortunately how our politics works. You know, this is how our media works, where they just overlook six months of relentless intentional targeting of aid workers and and medics and other civilian you know uh, palestinians as well and they just ignore all of that and then you have a massive strike like this and oh we're going to put out a statement and say oh we're investigating this who knows how it happened it was unintentional we're so sorry blah 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 right again if you harm an american we will respond that was joe biden Let, let's see what he responds with this time uh if you know i had to predict I would anticipate that it's going to be more shit like this. So this just came out yesterday. 
So we talked about multiple different rounds of aid that Biden has been either shoveling to Israel under the table or trying to get passed through congressional legislation. I mean, here's another one. Biden administration set to greenlight $18 billion sale of F-15 fighter jets to Israel. So the planes that are going and dropping bombs on the heads of innocent Palestinian men, women, and children, uh, we're going to send them $18 billion more of those, as, as well as sending them, you know, thousands of 2,000 pound bombs that even the U.S. military said that they wouldn't be using in such a densely populated place like the Gaza Strip and that Israel has used hundreds of times in Gaza. I mean, the 2,000 pound bombs in and of themselves are, are a crime. We're talking about a bomb that has a radius, a potential lethal radius of like a thousand feet in any given direction. It leaves craters that are dozens of feet wide. And they're dropping these. I mean, one of the most infamous examples was they dropped one on the Jabalia refugee camp, okay, and killed who knows how many, right, o over a hundred. And um, then they, they justify that after the fact and say, oh, well, it was because we wanted to target this, this one Hamas uh, official or commander. This is the kind of logic that they use. I mean, it's the same logic if even if you believe, you know, their claims here at face value, it's the same logic. Oh, well, we suspected there was maybe one Hamas militant that was near or in this convoy, and so we just killed everybody. We, we shot three different drone missiles at their three different cars in order to, uh, to get that one hypothetical Hamas militant. It's the same shit that they've been doing throughout the entirety of, of this, you know, offensive and throughout the entirety of the Gaza Strip. I mean, $18 billion in fighter jets. We also had this State Department human rights staffer resigns over Biden's Gaza policy. So this was from, you know, a week or a week ago or so at this point. But I did want to mention it because it shows, I mean, at least there is some degree, you know, as limited as it is of uh, pushback and people even within the State Department who are, you know, resigning and, and trying to rein in Joe Biden in his relentless support for every single thing that Israel wants to do. I mean, he really, if anything... You know, uh, putting the rhetoric aside of him, oh, I'm so angry at Benjamin Netanyahu behind the scenes. If anything, it feels like over the last month or so, he has done more to give Israel the green light than even before that. I mean, sending a as many weapon shipments to them, green lighting now $18 billion in, in fighter jets and sending more additional, you know, 2,000 pound bombs. It's like, what message does Israel get from that? Do you think they're going to take your advice of, oh, you need to care more about Palestinian civilians while you're giving them weapons with, with absolutely no strings attached whatsoever and, and not holding them accountable in any way whatsoever? What, what kind of message do you think that that sends to them? I mean, Biden is, is at this point and, and has been for a while now, 100% complicit in all of this. And just to leave you guys off with this, I mean, this was the most pathetic thing that I've seen uh, from Biden maybe ever. So a while ago, and I've talked about this multiple times now, Biden imposed these like basically meaningless sanctions on like a handful of violent Israeli settlers. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it was just a, it was a total virtue signal. It was hollow. It, it didn't really have any implications in terms of the ongoing expansionist settlement policy under Benjamin Netanyahu. You know, recently, a couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, his government approved the largest land grab uh, on Palestinian occupied territories in decades um, while they were actually having a meeting with uh, Anthony Blinken just to kind of spit in his face. So they've been they've been doing these drastic expansions and ramping up of the illegal settlements in the West Bank. And so Biden, oh, I'm going to crack down on them, right? I'm going to sanction a couple settlers. And then now, hear from Trita Parsi, I mean, he just walked it back and gave the settlers access to their bank accounts again. So he cannot even stay true or stay firm on his totally meaningless, hollow virtue signaling. That's how pathetic he is. I mean, he is weaker in regards to cracking down on Israel than Ronald Reagan was, or that George Bush Sr. was. I mean, it is, it is the most pathetic and disgusting shit that I've ever seen. Okay, so I'm going to have, again, another video later where we're going to break down that massive strike at the Iranian embassy and how, you know, that could potentially spark off an even broader escalation. But I mean, it really does just get worse and worse by the day. And I, I don't know how much longer we can go without a vast majority of the world just recognizing what seems to be a, a fact at this point, that Israel is just a total rogue state, that they do not abide even remotely by any sort of standards of international law or human rights law. And they're essentially at this point just a full-blown fascist expansionist 
uh, genocidal regime that needs to be cracked down on, needs to be put back in their place. And it's unfortunate that the one guy in the world who actually has massive power over Israel to be a check on them is Joe Biden. And he's absolutely refusing to do it.